No, we haven't started yet. We're just going live. Let folks sign in. Uh, it's 1.56. We'll start up right at about 2 o'clock. Yes, my mic is on. It's uh, 158. We got two more minutes. We'll start up at two o'clock. Probably should have had a theme song going here since that's the name of the uh, session, but. The dead or Tesla version? No, no, I'm old school. It's uh, definitely the 60s version, the uh, electric band version. So. Uh, it's 11.59. It's we'll start up in about one minute. And yes, the Tesla version is a pretty good version, but uh, I'm an old school. So good afternoon and uh, welcome to our Tuesday afternoon webinar. My name is David Orr. I'm the director here at the Cornell Local Roads Program and uh, we're going to do a session on uh, signs, everywhere there's a sign. A couple of preliminaries before we get started. Uh, for those of you who are dialing in, remember the uh, chat pod's been disabled. But uh, you can ask a question in the question and answer pod, or you can raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, we'll try to, you know, we'll probably do that now and then to ask you a question here and there, have a little bit of fun with it. 
Um, if you've got somebody having a problem with the computer and you're sharing, if you're both registered, you can share the computer. Uh, just both have to be registered. They'll uh, leave your computer on so that you know you were still logged in. Don't don't log off. Um, this session is worth uh, one PDH professional development here in New York State. Uh, only the person who's registered. So that's why I'm saying if you're sharing and you're having computer issues, make sure the person who's having the problem leaves their computer registered. Uh, it's considered a course, which is good for those who need, you know, half your credits have to be courses here in New York. When you're done, you'll get a certificate of attendance if you attend at least two thirds of the session. If you attend the 90% and you send us a certificate of attendance, we'll send you the professional development hour. Now, if you're not from New York State, I apologize a little bit, but uh, you'll have to check with your local LTAP center and uh, see what the rules are there. So just so you are aware of that particular issue. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yes. Before we get going too far, let's do a poll question just because it helps me. I'm going to launch the poll. There are th actually three questions here. How many folks at your site? I work for, and then scroll down a little bit, you'll see how long have you been with your job. Um, this just helps me in terms of how much detail I get to certain questions. So we'll try to get about 75% of you answering the questions. Okay, getting close. Okay, there we go. We got enough in the polling. I'll share the results with you. So as we've seen, typically, most of you are by yourself in the world of COVID-19. A few of you have more. A few of you have 10 or more. So hopefully you're practicing good uh, distancing apart. A lot of you work for local government, about two thirds, but there's some consultants, some state folks, contractors, and there's a few of you who are honest and you work for the weekend. My big problem with the weekends, I'm not sure what day that is. Uh, and in terms of experience, again, quite a range, though half of you have been there for more than 10 years. Cool. Now, if you're wondering today, and uh, what are the handouts for today's session? Well, I got good news and I got bad news with you. The good news is there is no handout. The reason there's no handout is that instead of worrying about a handout and going crazy, Instead, we're going to take advantage of the fact that we produce a thing called the Traffic Sign Handbook, and I'll give you more information about that. But if you need any of the information for today's uh, workshop, the good news is to get to it, all you got to do is go onto our website and search for MUTCD. When my computer catches up, you'll see what it looks like on the screen here. There we go. So go to our website, www.clrp.cornell.edu, and in up, the upper right, on most every single page on our website, there's a nice search box that uh, Adam Howell has made sure works like a charm. Type in the word, or letters, M-U-T-C-D, hit enter, and the first thing that will come up is a link to the page that I have highlighted on the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. You can get information uh, on the traffic sign handbook, how to get your own copy electronically of both the national and state supplements to the MUTCD. So that's what we're going to have today, as since there really isn't a handout. That's really the best tool for you. Okay. So now we're going to have start along a little bit. Before we get too much into the signs themselves, let's talk a little bit about uh, what's going on here. Okay. So. Here we have a roadway, nice little rural road. Uh, if you can see the sign, the critical sign in this particular thing, raise your hand or type into the question and answer pod what you think the critical sign is. Oh, a lot of you raised your hand. Okay, good. So you're raising your hand. Let's see, uh, has anybody put it into the Q&A pod? Not yet. A right turn with a speed advisory? Yeah, that's a good one, a curve sign. Yep. Not good visibility. Up, oh, stop ahead, somebody caught it. Yeah, there's actually a stop ahead here, okay? It's right here. 
there's a stop ahead sign. In fact, we'll see if my computer will put the arrow on for you. And survey says, there it is. So there's actually a stop sign. And while you can't tell, there's actually a stop sign at the bottom of a relatively steep hill with, as you can tell, for those who caught it, uh, at uh, 15 mile an hour corner right before a stop sign on a steep hill. Those signs are pretty important. You miss the corner or you miss the stop sign, you're gonna have a really bad day. And by the way, when you come around the corner in this particular case, you go across the state highway, and if you don't stop, you go over an embankment that's about 25 feet high. So yeah, those signs are pretty important, and signs are how we communicate. People like to send me pictures, and so they send me fun pictures of different signs, and I've collected some stop signs here for you just to show you that uh, I think we can do better than this. So what do signs do for us? Why do we have signs? Well, signs, whether they're from a, a national or a state handbook or they're uh, just a supplement, signs do really three things. They communicate our regulations, our warnings, and our information. But good signage does this really well. Poor signage might communicate something else, like that we're lazy, that we speed on our own dead-end roadways where uh, the only people driving there should be people who live on the road or visiting. Or my favorite, we don't know where we're going, okay? So let's talk a little bit about signs. And by the way, I'm focusing on general signage, but I also want you to understand work zones are one of our most important places we put up good signs. And again, I've got collections over the years of some pretty poor signs in a work zone, okay? So as an example, and my computer today has decided to fight me, and it's, so far it's winning. There we go. So there's a flagger standing about maybe the worst possible place he could stand. He's not looking at me. Uh, a couple of sidewalks being replaced with a sign that says cross ahead, cross of the crosswalk. Wait a second. How do I go down that road without walking in the middle of the road? Okay. And then I think actually in some respects, one of my favorites of all time, this is near my house here in Ithaca, New York, and you can see that yellow piece of tape. It took me about five or six sh shots to get it. Uh, that's just a piece of the yellow sticky tape that says do not cross, okay? And uh, well, yeah, that's all they had for work zone signage. Uh, somebody in the question and answer pod said, isn't he giving me a salute? He didn't give me a salute at first. I stopped about 100 feet from him, and then I took his picture, and I crept forward 10 feet. I took his picture again. I got about 40 feet from him before he did give me a salute. Yeah, he actually, I think he told me I was number one. At least I saw a finger, so I, I assumed it was number one. So what should signs do? Good signs should do five things. They should fulfill a need, okay? Is there really a need for the sign? They should command attention, okay? They're properly placed, they're visible, they've got the right color. They could convey a clear, simple meaning and tell the driver what to do, okay? They shouldn't be odd. We'll give some examples of that. They should command respect because they've been maintained and they're placed properly. And they should give time for response. If they don't give the time for response, then how do you have a chance to really take advantage of the sign itself, okay? So those are all pretty important things. And again, my computer has decided today to be really slow, but give time for response, okay? A lot like my computer. So let's talk about some of the critical issues. How do you like this? This is a lovely intersection. Um, I don't know what the most important sign here is. Is it the curve, the do not enter, the stop? I mean, all the signs are nice and bright, but they're so closely spaced that we can't really uh, see anything, okay? We don't really know which sign to look at first. So that's gonna be an issue for all of us, okay? So one of the rules of thumb that comes up, and this is something that we talk about in our general sign class, and it's in our sign workbook that was put together by uh, Al Bachner and Ken Swain, 
we want to spread the signs apart. We want to give ourselves some time to actually read and incorporate the signs into our thinking, okay? So that's pretty important, okay? Now, how far apart should we spread those signs? Well, a good rule of thumb is take the speed times five to seven, and uh, that's the distance in feet that you want to use. So if your speed limit is 55 miles an hour, we'll make it 60, because that's what people actually drive. That's about 360 feet apart between the signs. If they're too closely spaced, people don't have time to read them. Think about the old Burma shade signs. They spaced them apart so people would time, time to read them. Though, please don't put Burma shade signs back up on our road system. So that technique is called primacy. We place the more critical signs right where they need to be placed and we move other signs in relation so people have time to read them. So obviously the first sign we wanna put up is the stop signs and the key really important warning signs like that stop ahead sign that we saw or the curve sign, okay? So that's the first one we wanna do. The next thing we wanna be placing after that are other warning signs such as intersections, okay? Not as critical, but still we wanna let people know they're there. Other regulatory signs, even the speed limit signs should be moved to make sure that people actually have time to read the more critical ones, okay? And then finally, guide signs, we place them where we can. Information signs even more likely to be moved around. So people have time to read and understand them, okay? Now here, I don't think we have enough advanced notice in front of the uh, work zone, okay? And there might be something wrong with the color. I, I don't know, I, maybe a pink bump sign on a white cardboard is, I don't think this is really the right sign. Now, in terms of how far in advance do you need to be? Um, oh, before we get into primacy, are you calling out arterials? Okay, is there a different primacy? Is there a different order to the signs? I'll even go back here, my computer. For major roads like an arterial or an interstate? Uh, well, actually, no you still want to have the more critical signs. So obviously we're not going to have any stop signs, but you still want to space those signs apart. But if people are going faster, you actually want to spread those signs even further apart. And you see it all the time, people cluster the signs together. And if there's an important sign, they can miss them, okay? Now, yeah, so guide signs are important on a limited access highway, but you may have to move things around some. Now here we have our bump that we had here. Here's a rule of thumb. If you think about it, if you're traveling a certain miles per hour, you can calculate the number of feet per second by multiplying by 1.47 precisely. Why don't you use one and a half? That's close enough for most of what we need. So if you're traveling down a road at 60 miles an hour, that means about 87, 88 feet, or I can do the math in my head if it's 1.5, 90 feet per second. Okay, so you definitely want to have it in advance of the curve or in advance of the stop sign so people have time to react. Okay, but of course, they have to be able to see the sign. So, who can see the sign here? And tell me what the sign says. Put it in the question and answer pod. People are raising their hands. Up, oh, stop. Okay, yep, there's a stop sign there. And only reason I could see it was I was only about 30 feet from the intersection by the time I could actually see the stop sign poking out from the, behind the bush. At 200 feet, it is completely lost. At 150 feet, it's just picking out. Well, that's not good enough. We really want those signs to be nice and bright and be able to be seen. Otherwise, it's pretty dangerous, okay? So keep that in mind as you're thinking about your signage, okay? So location matters, okay? Location, location, location. Uh, someone wants to know, is that a police trap? Uh, no, that's not a police trap. Uh, that just happens to be a place where the person who owned the bushes uh, didn't like them trimming the sign. The police trap is further down the road with the speed limits lowered artificially, but that's a different problem. Um, oh, by the way, at night, it's uh, not very good because that sign was not retro-reflective, if you're wondering. And yes, the sign's a little low too. Location matters, they're standards for the signs, okay? So you can see, for instance, uh, a stop sign on the far side of an intersection, 
that's not really the right place because you and I know you're supposed to stop at the stop sign. In this case, if you miss the one on the right, you might find out the hard way that you were in the middle of an intersection. And I actually love the one on the left. Think about the bicyclist trying to use the bike lane and they've put a big sign right in the way. Okay, so location matters. So um, raise your hand when you can read the sign. It's a little easier on the computer. When I do this on a big screen, it's actually harder. But yeah, most of you should be able to see it even now. Okay. Of course, by the time I've even clicked it a couple of times, most of you know what that sign says. Okay, it's bridge closed. When we talk to the public, one of the things they have to realize is how big those signs really need to be. Okay. This is a picture. Yes, this is an actual sign in Wyoming. It's uh, a steep cliff falling, well, in this particular case, falling cows, okay? But look how big the sign is. Most people don't quite understand how big that uh, signs need to be. Closer to three feet in most cases for warning signs, okay? And bigger, of course, is going to be better. Uh, let's see, we have a question here for the last one. Is that, if that's not the correct place for the stop sign, what would be a better solution if it was a problem intersection? On the last one back here, uh, this one right here, or are we talking about the one before? That one. Okay, the problem is not this. This stop sign over here on the right is correct. It's the one on the far side of the intersection. That sign should be removed. You can leave the double cross box but you never wanna put the stop sign ahead of where somebody would safely be able to stop. Because most people know that if they stop where the stop sign is, they at least feel they should be safe. So if you needed to double stop that one, you would actually put it on the left side of the road before the intersection. Good question though. Okay. Okay, so uh, what's the most important sign here? Put it in the question and answer pod. What's the most important sign here? Up, oh, there's got, nobody knows. Route signs, got a couple of people getting it. Which way the state route goes? A few of you are getting it. Most of these signs could be important, you know, if you're trying to find the railroad station or trying to find this bobsled run, but, um, if you're having a heart attack, the hospital sign, I suspect, is probably the most important, okay? And yet, until about 10 years ago, that sign that's brown and yellow was legal in this state. They've since sort of said, no, hospital signs shall always be white on blue. Because when you need to find the hospital, it's pretty darn important, okay? So there are standards in the MUTCD, the sign manuals, for the design and layout of the signs, size of the font, size of the sign, the colors, they all make a difference. Unlike this lovely one here, caution, this sign has sharp edges, do not touch the edges of this sign. And at the very bottom, also the bridge is out ahead. We need to have simple, understandable language that people can see. It makes a big difference. Okay, now here's a fun one. Let's see if y'all can see this one. Uh, we'll clear all the answers and get ready to raise your hands. Let me lower all the hands over here. There we go. Okay, can you see it? Uh, a few folks see it. Okay. If you see it, you could uh, put it into the uh, chat pod or the question and answer pod. Try the next one. How about again? How about now? Yeah, now it gets easy, okay. How bright the sign is makes a big difference, especially at night, okay? I took this photograph near Utica, New York, and that's an actual sign, and it's a pretty important sign if you missed it, going down a pretty steep hill into Utica. And during the day, it's a little easier to see, isn't it? Okay. So how bright the sign is makes a big difference. Okay. And we need more light as we age, like it or not. I mean, it's uh, pretty important to have good, more light as we age. Okay. 
I'm somewhere between, I'll say four and eight, though I'm not really as close to four as I'd like to be. But the older we get, the more light we need. And that's just the nature of the beast, okay? And so how bright the signs are makes a big difference, okay? And so keep that in mind. And that term we use for that is called retro reflectivity. It's not the light that bounces like a, off a wall or a mirror. It's the light that comes back because of either little beads or prisms in the sign. And retro reflectivity really does matter, okay? Now, all of these things are incorporated in the sign standards. Everything from primacy down to brightness. So keep that in mind. That's why we have these standards. It's important we have consistency. When people ask me what the most important word in the manual of uniform traffic control devices is, I usually say uniform. Having a consistent sign makes a difference. Whether you're in Montana, upstate New York, Long Island, Georgia, it doesn't matter. You want to have signs consistent so everybody drives safely or as safely as we can get them to drive. Okay. Now, one of the questions that we get asked quite often is, well, what about existing signs? New York State Vehicle and Traffic Law allows you to use signs in stock unless there's a specific compliance date, okay? But if you're buying new signs or you're putting them up, they have to meet the MUTCD. There are two caveats, however, here. Number one, if there is federal aid involved, then you've got to bring it up in compliance. And number two, that use of signs in stock, it's actually 10 years. So you can use your existing signs in stock for up to 10 years, but after that, you really should be using whatever the new standard is. And I'll show you some examples of that. And here's the text for those who care. Non-compliant devices shall be brought into compliance as part of a systematic upgrading. Okay, what that really means is, do me a favor, as you replace signs, bring them up to speed, okay? Now, if you want the actual dates, you can get them. They're right in the front of the MUTCD. Okay, and you get a lovely table. I'm going to show you part of that table. I'm going to now read your mind. Watch this. I'm going to read your mind. Most of you are thinking, the font is too small. I can't read it. And you're now going to read my mind, and it's going to be, don't try to read it. The values are in the MUTCD. Don't try to read that little font. Just go find the MUTCD, and I'll show you, as I say, how to find it later on. Some of the more critical compliance states that are in the MUTCD, there's some standards. We were supposed to be using crashworthy post all the way back in 2013 for any roads of 50 miles an hour or more, which is most of the state highways and a lot of the local system here in New York State. Retroreflectivity, there are some standards for retroreflectivity that have been put into place, okay, when my computer catches up. January of 2015 was when we were supposed to pick a plan on how we were going to deal with how bright the signs were. And 2018, we were supposed to have a lot of signs put up. However, they pulled back on most of those standards. So the good news is the only one that really matters, actually now going back to 2012, is how are we going to deal with how bright our signs are. High vis apparel, I hope you're all using it because it was a requirement for anyone in the right of way as of December of 2011. Okay. Now, a couple more recent ones that have just come into play. One is on horizontal alignment signs, and I'll show you the detail. That's 2019 of last year. And railroad cross bucks as well were supposed to be December of last year. Now, there's a couple of specific ones in New York State that I just want to remind you of. We're supposed to be using the one with the little dot for no turn on red as of September of 2017 and stop ahead signs all the way back to September of 2015. So we actually shouldn't be seeing many of these. You should not be putting new ones up, okay? In fact, every sign is supposed to have been replaced by 2015 because New York State actually adopted the symbol version of the stop ahead sign in 2005 with an update of the state MUTC, which was still done back then, okay? Now, in terms of the handbook, the one I showed you on my little screen here, and I want you to you can go download a copy off our website. The handbook was invented not by us, but by the New York State Department of Transportation back in 1980s. We took over uh, printing it in around 2002, and we've done several editions since. It covers about 90% of the signage in the rural system. And in a village or a city, pretty much everything except for 
parking signs and some of the more detailed regulatory signs. It does not cover, however, mainline roads like interstates. Uh, someone asked, is a newer version of the MUTCD being issued that incorporates all of these things? Well, they're always updating things, so they haven't done a lot. Uh, the last time I talked to someone who was on the National Committee for the MUTCD, uh, they hoped something would come out this year, but probably not. <laughs> so it looks like we're going to be having the same MUTCD for at least the next 18 months to two years, but that may change. Always look out, check with your LTAP center. We'll try to keep you up to speed when all of these things change, okay? But at the end of the day, uh, follow the MUTCD when possible. And if you can't, what three things do you think you have to do? Let's see if anybody catches up here. Well, you have to document, document, and document. Those are the three things you should be doing, okay? Never assume, okay? Always document everything you can. And by the way, some people on the question and answer were saying that the uh, New York State supplement lags, sort of like my computers decided to do today. Yes and no. One of the weird things, the way the law is currently written here in New York, is the New York State supplement may lag, but the day the MUTCD becomes in force at the federal level, you may have to follow the national MUTCD. So be careful. In terms of what do you document? You document any time you cannot follow the MUTCD precisely. And frankly, you should document it even when you can. So let's make sure you understand when you have to document. There's three major words that we should get in our brain. Shall, should, and may. Okay. Now, in addition to the shall, should, and may, there's some other words that are in there that you might come across when you're reading the MUTCD. Standard, guidance, option, and support. Okay. So let me see if my computer is going to decide to wake up today. It's being really slow. Standard, guidance, and support. If you see the word standard, that means shall. You have to do it. Okay. No exceptions, okay? They've pretty much gotten rid of any place where there's a conflict. So if it says standard or shall, you gotta do it. Like a stop sign, shall be white on red, okay? Shaped like an octagon. Guidance means you should do it, okay? It's really recommended, and this is a place where you definitely wanna document. If you can't do it, you need to write down why, okay? And then finally, there are some options that may, is the term you'll sometimes see. You can do it if you need to, or if you feel it's gonna help improve highway safety or traffic flow, but it's only an option, but always document. And then throughout the MUTCD, you're gonna come across support documents that will help you figure out when to choose a may and how to know whether something is a super critical should and really almost a shall or maybe not as critical in your particular location. Now, a couple of things to remind folks. If you're designing, for instance, a mall, well, the MUTCD actually applies to all roads, okay? That includes private property open to public travel. So it may not be a public road, but if you're driving around the big mall, that road should still follow the MUTCD. And the reason is simple. We want to have that uniformity so the public doesn't somehow have a different set of rules when they drive into a parking area. Now, the bays and the aisles, yeah, we're not going to go crazy into the middle of the bay here where the car is going up and down the aisle, but still is something to keep in mind, okay? But do me a favor. When you're talking to someone, don't put up in a state that's like New York where they don't yield to pedestrians crossing, but how many times do you see a stop for pedestrians crossing? All signs shall be crashworthy. This has actually been in place since January of 2013 for roads at 50 miles an hour or more. What that really means is make sure the signs, if they get struck, don't actually make the crash worse, okay? The stubs should be no more than four inches above the ground if you're using a ground pole, and they should be designed and tested for being crashworthy. Now, the old standard was something called NCHRP 350. Now we're using a standard called MASH, the Manual for Assessment of Safety Hardware from AASHTO. But your state and the federal government both have good websites to list 
what's available to you, okay? Now, here's one of my favorites that you still see quite often. In fact, I hate to say it, when I walk around the campus on my morning walks, I sometimes come across this particular sign. If you're putting up a stop sign or a yield sign, the silhouette of the sign should actually be a stop sign or a yield sign, okay? So don't put up a sign behind the stop sign that makes it hard to tell whether it's a stop sign or a yield sign, okay? And the simple for, reason for that is those two signs are unique. They're the only ones with their shapes. So if you see it, even if it's really faded, you can tell it's still a yield sign. And you'd be amazed at night, yeah, this sign isn't retroreflective enough, but you'd still see it at night enough to know, wait a second, I'm coming up on an intersection, okay? Your rail crossings, you have to put the lollipop, as some people like to call it, the reflective stripe going up and down the pole, okay? That should have been placed as of December of last year, okay? Now, interestingly enough, the ones at the crossing are supposed to be put up by the rail company, but the advanced signage is usually put up, at least here in New York, by the agency that owns the road. But look around for those, those are pretty important, okay? Curve sign placement, this again was one that started last, should have been done by last year. Essentially, your curve sign should be placed so that on your collectors and arterials, and I know a lot of us own local roads, we don't have this, but you have to have the signs, curve sign with a plaque if needed, if there's a difference of 10 miles an hour or more, okay? So you have to have the sign that's at the bottom of the picture on the lower left if it's 10 miles an hour or more. It's still recommended, it's still a should, even with less than that, okay? Chevrons and arrows are required if it's 15 miles an hour or more, okay? And that's, a, yes, technically only for collectors and arterials, but it's actually still a good idea even on the local system. And in some respects, maybe even more important because if someone's not familiar with the roadway, do we really want them missing a pretty sharp corner? Retroreflectivity standards, again, how bright are our signs? They're pretty important. Those standards have been in place. The way the original thing was, it was 2012, we picked a method of management. 2015, we were supposed to have replaced all of our warning regulatory and guide signs and the street signs by 2018, but we pulled back from that. So now the only thing that really matters is to have a good management plan in place. I actually think that's okay if you have a management plan that you actually follow, okay? So what that says is, I've got a plan to upgrade my sign so that they're bright enough and I'm gonna follow through with it. And so over a 10 or 20 year period, I'm gonna make sure every sign is nice and bright, okay? Now, which signs are allowed, which sheeting is allowed? Well, there's a table that's available in the MUTCD and you can read the table if you'd like to. I did a sort of simplified version of it. And so I would said, I'll put up a green dot if it's allowed. So I can use any kind of sheeting for speed limit signs. And yeah, they're not as critical. Surprisingly, any type of sheeting for a stop sign, as long as it's got enough contrast, it meets the minimum brightness standard, okay? But for warning signs, we're not supposed to be using engineering grade anymore. In fact, while super engineering grade is allowed, I actually like the high intensity types with the prismatic beads, those two types are really much better. They're brighter at night, and economically, they're pretty good. For street signs, the background could be anything, but the lettering itself, you'll want the higher grade sheeting, okay? And we could do a whole hour on retroreflectivity, and if you're interested, let us know. Maybe we'll make that a webinar that we could do sometime in uh, June or something like that. Now, according to the standards, and actually there's a slide uh, out there that says certain signs are exempt. And it listed parking, standing, stopping, walking, hitchhiking, adopt a highway, blue or brown, excessive use of, exclusive use of bikes and peds. First off, while these were exempted from a numerical standard, they still need to be bright. Because think about it, are the kids going to school at night? Do we still want pedestrian signs to be visible? Is that hospital open 24 hours a day? Is that sign pretty important? So while they're exempted from a numerical standard, 
there still needs to be retroreflective. They still need to be seen at night if they're used at night. Now, question in the question and answer, have there been any lawsuits alleging the negligence for no retroreflectivity? <laughs> uh, I haven't looked lately. The last time I looked was about, oh, about the time the MUTCD retroreflectivity standard came out. But about 80% of all lawsuits involving highways, they throw signs. They just love, oh, there was a problem with a sign. And so there have been lawsuits lost because the signs weren't bright enough. Whether they were specifically because they didn't meet the retro standard, I have to be honest, I don't know. But uh, we can look that up. Uh, maybe we'll do that as a quick answer into the future. That might be a good one to look up. We'll see if we can find some for you. But trust me, if it's less than the standard, somebody will probably sue, and I will not be surprised if I find some, but I honestly don't know for sure. Now, how do you do retroreflectivity? Well, you could do a visual assessment where you drive around, preferably at night, but there are ways to do some day things, but mostly at night. You can measure it with a retroreflectometer. You could do expected sign life if you've got a control set of signs uh, that are sitting up there and expected life from the manufacturer. You could just replace all the signs on a particular road, or you could put signs up. Uh, Monroe County has a bunch of signs at their airport and they just monitor them. And when the signs facing to the south go bad, those signs will get replaced and they can calculate then the expected sign life as well. So you could do two at once. Again, we could do a whole hour on just this. Which method? You need to pick the one that works best for your agency. I like nighttime assessment, but whatever works well for your agency and protects the public, that's the method you should use. Now, people want to ask about pavement markings. Are there standards? They keep trying to put standards into the MUTCD for pavement markings. They have not yet made them official. There have been ones that have been drafted. But remember, pavement markings are still out there. So they need to be bright enough that people can see them. So keep that in mind as you're going forward. We don't want to do like if our picture will show up here. We don't want to forget about something and just pretend that it doesn't exist. OK? You have to keep that in mind. OK? Our lovely fox. Okay, in the middle of all the hounds. Now, one of my favorite things that was changed about 10 years ago with the MUTCD is the combined curve and intersection sign. It's a pretty cool sign, and you see them all over. They're getting more and more popular. You can use them for all kinds of intersections, but remember, you should not have more than two side roads on top of the sign, but it allows you to combine signs together and actually help the public. So here's an actual intersection. Uh, can somebody tell me what sign I should have here instead of the Y, by the way? The main road goes off to the left. So what sign should I have actually had there? Technically, if I'm going to have two signs up, a left curve of the side street saved, a left curve combined, arrow to the left, this is what you would have right here if you were using two signs separate. One would be the main road technically <laughs> is the main road up and down and the side roads off to the right. That's very confusing to the public. But if you combine the two together, you could actually make something that looks like what the public would see. It's actually better information for the public. Combine them into one sign at the first location that you would have put the sign up. Make sure you chevron it properly. And this is actually going to be easier for the public to see. Okay. Now, if you're putting up fluorescent yellow, that's a common sign color that we're using these days. Okay. Fluorescent yellow green. Um, I like the color and there's some standards for that. If you're putting them up for playgrounds, uh, walking across uh, the roadway, you're allowed to use it, okay? If you're putting them in a school zone, they're required. So school zones have to be that new fluorescent yellow green. You may use them for others. My advice is be consistent within your area and preferably even work with your neighboring communities and try to be consistent within a particular area. Street signs. The MUTC can be confusing in this because it talks about this odd mixture of cases and language. Just think of it this way. Street signs have two different fonts. 
just like two different fonts in the computer. Okay, there is the big font, six inches. Okay, and there's the small font, four inches. Okay, easy way to think about it. So you just want to have six inch lettering or four inch lettering. When you see in the MUTCD where it talks about this lowercase, um, no, just call it a six inch font and a three inch font and it's actually easier. Where can you use them? Essentially a four inch font is allowed on 30 miles an hour roads here in New York State. If you're not in New York State, that number is 25 for those of you who may have called in from another state. Again, check with your own state supplement, it might be different. But here in New York, it's 30 miles an hour, okay? No block lettering. And the reason is it's easier to read, okay? The colors, colors should be either white on green, white on blue, white on brown, or black on white. We didn't want these odd colors. Now, have I seen some that I think look pretty cool? Yeah, I have, but we had to put the standard in because people were putting up some really odd things, okay? Now a question came up, how are private roads shown? The way you would do a private road, and actually you can do this for a county road as well, you put a thing on the end and you put yellow box, it says private road, okay? For a county road, if this were a county road, you could actually put the county shield over here on the left, okay? Those things are allowed and they're in the MUTCD. Now, why did we put symbols before we put legends. Why is it preferred to have the one on the right versus the one on the left? What do you think? Language barrier? I hear that a lot. Quicker understanding. Yeah, there you go. Quicker understanding. It turns out symbol signs are recognized 50% further if they're good symbols, okay? So that's why it's not because of whether people can read or not. Most of us know the words, even if we don't understand the language. But the symbol signs are easier to understand. Hey, I said stop ahead. Okay. Now, that's a good symbol. There are some that have been discontinued. Does anybody know what that particular old symbol means? It's no longer in the MUTCD. What does it mean? Pavement in, somebody knew pretty quick, yeah. But it, most public doesn't know that. Yeah, chip seal ahead, paved or gravel. It isn't essentially the pavement in, but that's one to hard to understand. So in that particular case, it's actually better to have text, okay? You're supposed to have on good retroreflective clothing, please. That means a vest is actually properly put on, okay? How many workers are there in the picture? Okay. Six? Seven? Okay, let's just we'll do a quick count here. One, two, three, four, five, six. You should have gotten six, but it's a lot easier to see Luckily, they've all had hard hats, but that gentleman without the vest on, he's hard to see, okay? So please put on the safety equipment, okay? Because complex backgrounds can create confusion. Let's try this again. How many of that time? Nobody wants to guess. Four, 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 one, three, Okay, if you only had a glance, how many of you would have thought there were actually five? Okay. And when my computer catches up, we'll see there are actually five people in this particular photograph. Three of them with the accident investigation unit wearing a vest. Two of them with the uh, state trooper investigation squad who said, well, we're carrying guns uh, at 55 miles an hour the car doesn't care, okay? So put the vest on. Yes, there are special vests for people doing fire and police work, okay? But you wanna wear them in certain situations. That includes public safety personnel not engaged in an actual criminal event, okay? Doing traffic control or an investigation, okay? Now that's a basic summary of 
some of the more critical changes. There's a lot more that are out there, okay? I just want to give you some of the most common ones to help you understand what the MUTCD is and isn't, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to have a, hopefully a little bit of fun here. And let's not set my coffee cup in a spot where it's going to fall over on me. That would be really bad, okay? So first, before we get in too far into uh, things, we're going to do our last poll, okay? Let me go grab the poll here. And we're going to... launch the poll and ask the question, which is not needed, which is not a need for good signage? Fulfilling a need, commanding attention, making the public feel good, commanding respect, or giving time for a response? And again, we'll wait till we get about 75% of you voting, though. Most of you are doing pretty darn good. No issues there. Okay, so here we go. 75% of you will end the polling. We'll share the results. And yeah, it's not good signage to make the public, just to make the public feel good, okay? I know a lot of people are like, but that's what they want. But remember, the purpose of signage is help with traffic control, okay? The idea is to help the public safely navigate down our road system. So we really don't want to be doing that. Signs shouldn't be put up if they don't fulfill a need, okay? They should command attention. They should command respect. They should give a clear, simple message. Tell the driver what to do. They should give time for response. Okay. One of the reasons you'll see in the traffic sign handbook, we don't have the children at play sign. It is in the state supplement. Okay. They're actually about to put an autism sign in the state supplement. My concern with both of those signs is what is the message we're going to give to the driver? What is the driver supposed to do? If they're overused, and that's probably part of the problem with the children at play sign, is the sign has gotten so overused that nobody really knows what it is. It doesn't command respect anymore. It stays up way too long. So think about that when you're putting up signage, okay? And somebody put in the question and answer pod, well, what if the mayor's up for election? Well, trust me, we've all had to do it, put up signs we didn't think had to be put up, but that's the ethics class. That's so a different one. We already did that one. We could do it again, okay? I'm a firm believer and putting up good signage if you can. Because yes, somebody else says, why are your kids playing in the street? Yeah, if that's the message, okay. There are other signs such as playground signs that could be used, okay. Are there things you could do instead? Heck, why not tell the kids to put a big wheel or have the parents put the big wheel on the side of the road when the kids are actually playing, and pick it up when they're done, okay. Now, of course, if they don't pick it up when they're done, you and I both know they're going to become the house with the big wheel beside it, but that's a different problem for a different day. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna end with five more questions. What I'm actually going to do is I'm gonna show you a picture of a sign that, well, it's got some issues. So in the question and answer pod, I would like you to put in what you think the problem is, okay? Now we're doing this on Facebook, okay? So I think you'll enjoy this. Each week, we're going to be putting up bad signs on Facebook. So go to our Facebook page, like us, and you can see them, or just go visit if you'd like. And we've done one last week. We'll be doing more. Amanda's going to be putting them up there. But I've got five other ones that uh, we'll see how y'all do. So tell me what's wrong with these particular signs. So let's start with our first one here, when the computer decides to wake up. OK. So there's our sign, it says stop ahead and it says firehouse. So what is wrong with that particular sign? It's a mixed message, yep, that's a good one. No symbol for stop, that should be a symbol sign, correct? It's confusing, it's two different signs, they're unrelated, okay? So it really should have been, okay? This should have been the symbol version of the sign, okay? And then 
on a separate pole in a separate location, far enough apart so you're not confusing people, probably further back because it's probably not as critical, you would put up an intersection sign, again, depending on which side of the road the fire hall is, with the word firehouse or fire hall, okay? Two separate installations, okay? And which comes first? That's a great question. It comes down to how critical it is, okay? You normally would, whoa, my computer decided to do something odd. I'm going to have to restart it while it's uh, yelling at. I have to go in and deal with uh, putting up the stop ahead sign would probably go first, okay? And then the second sign that would go up would be the uh, one for the uh, location of the fire hall. So you'd probably move the fire hall sign further back. So the first sign you see might actually be the fire hall one, but it would depend on how the load ra road lays out. Okay, so keep that in mind. It might vary quite a bit. Okay, so let me get back here and share my screen one time real quick. And so, okay. And then we'll get the uh, last pictures here. Oh, I hit the wrong button, uh, but I can get to it real quick. There we go. Okay. Okay, so what's wrong with this one? Let's see if somebody can figure out what's wrong with this particular one. No mile per hour underneath, how slow? Yeah, you need a speed, okay? If there is no plaque, what is the technical speed for that particular corner? It's whatever the speed limit is, yeah. So it's a 55 mile an hour road, you would say that, that I assume I can drive around it at 55. So you really wanna put a plaque underneath here, okay? That's pretty important. Okay, let's see if it'll go to the next one. What's wrong with this one? Yeah, you don't, you want a stop sign by itself. You just want to see, okay, a stop sign shape. You really shouldn't have that separated or should have that separated. So people can tell that's a stop sign, even if it were a dim sign. This is a nice and bright one but they should be by themselves. Very good, okay? Okay. Okay, what's wrong with this one? We got uh, two more to go here. There we go. What's wrong with this one here? The uh, one that says road closed, local traffic only. And if you can't tell, by the way, the big yellow thing in front is a piece of concrete. Yep, it's a hazard. Signs, even signs in work zones should still be crash worthy, okay? That's a deadly fixed object. You shouldn't be putting that up. If you're gonna put up a road close sign, there are much better signs to put up. You wanna have the proper barricades, a type three barricade if it's properly closed, okay? Maybe a type two at the beginning that people can get around, but certainly at the end of type three, okay? So yeah, that's, that's good. Okay, we got a couple more here. What's wrong with this one? Caution yield to pedestrians. Yeah, it's too low. It has to be at least a foot off the ground. It's not even close to standard, okay? Not even close, okay? This particular one, by the way, is also not ref retro-reflective at night, so that's a different problem. But yeah, if you were gonna be putting a pedestrian sign up, you would put the pedestrian symbol in here, okay? And if it was actually at the crosswalk, 
What do I need underneath? Yeah, I need an arrow, okay? And by the way, it doesn't matter, remember, that it's on a private road. It matters that it's publicly accessible. It still should meet the MUTCD, okay? And we've seen that one. Here we go. What's wrong with this one? Last one. And we'll let you go. Hopefully a few laughed. Yep, too truthful joke. Has come in and uh, covered over the uh, 16 miles. Okay. I don't think uh, 16 years, somebody's having a little bit of fun. But if it did say 16 miles, that's probably still too long. You probably shouldn't be saying to somebody the road is... 16 miles of roughness, okay? And yes, the road plaque should not be overlapping with the rough road sign, okay? So that's it. Hopefully you picked up something, picked up a few items of things you can think about. Uh, we do have some more webinars that are scheduled, okay? And when my computer decides to wake up, you'll see. Uh, tomorrow we're doing another Stump the Engineer session. We need some good questions, okay? So send us some questions via our email, which is CLRP at coinel.edu. Um, we're doing a webinar on erosion and sediment control on Thursday. Uh, you can come back and join us on Facebook Live for bumper banter. And then next uh, Tuesday, we're doing a seminar on why has my road failed already? And essentially, it's going to be dealing with what causes roads to fail, especially prematurely, and help you with maybe starting the idea of pavement design. With that, uh, remember, if you stayed for 60% or more, we'll send you a certificate or 75%. I always got to remember that number, most of it. Um, and if you need a professional development hour, when you get the certificate a day or two from now, send it to us and we'll get you a PDH. Okay, now I'll answer any questions you've got in the last couple of minutes. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, what are the requirements and benefits of having a sign inventory? Liability, economics. Um, you might also be able to deal with uh, costing, budget issues by knowing what you've got. Look for theft. Uh, essentially, it's an asset management tool. Just like anything in asset management, signs are part of that. So that's pretty important. Okay. Uh, somebody wants to know if the uh, presentation is available to download and save. Again, what I would advise you to do is download the traffic sign handbook, go to our website and search MUTCD and you can get the whole traffic sign handbook. And that may actually be a better tool for you. It's got all of the same information plus a whole bunch more. This whole presentation is being recorded and will be put up on our website and you'll be able to download and look at it again as a reference if you'd like to. Okay, uh, let's see. Is the average life of a small roadside 10 years or less? Actually, with proper signage, uh, the prismatics, some of those have 17 or 18 years of life, even facing south. Good, not The quality of the sign sheeting has gotten pretty good, but we may have to do maintenance for them. And they do degrade a little bit faster to the south, but uh, there's good evidence that they've got a good 17 to 20 year life to them, so that's good. Uh, size of lettering for road name signs, again, six inches, for any road names that are on high-speed roads above 30 miles an hour, four inches for roads less than 30 miles an hour and at 30 miles an hour here in New York State. The letters that are after the first are not uppercase. It's still the same font. Just think of it that way, six inch font, four inch font, and you'll be okay, okay? Uh, alignment of lines for uh, retroreflective tape, horizontal or vertically. Ah, for the tape, you'll see in some of the sheeting, the, the lines that are in there, technically they should be going up and down. Truth be told, those things are bright enough. <laughs> Just keep them well maintained and placed properly and they'll still last for an awfully long time, okay? Uh, different colors do degrade at different rates, absolutely. That's why you have to have, if you're doing this, the trees like they're doing in Monroe County, they have to have one of every single color because they have different lifespans to them, yep. 
and lamination can help extend the life of the material. That's why some of the newer sheetings, actually what they've really done is they've added extra sheets in the front to help keep them lasting evenly longer, okay? And then let's see, I think that's all the questions that we've got. Somebody wanted to know if one of the signs was near Racket Lake. I'm not telling. Uh, and then finally, how do we know you were present 100% of the time? We can tell. They actually tell us if you've been logged on the whole time. That's how we know. With that, I've taken a uh, little minute of your day. But uh, yep, uh, if you're interested, we do have a retro kit. It's available. I did not mention it today, if you're still on, to help you do retro reflectivity. The kit costs less than $50 to make. If you're interested on, just search for retro reflectivity and it'll come right up. Thanks, everybody, and have yourself a great day. Get outside. It looks like the nicest day in the next week. Get outside and enjoy the day. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.